If you would be turning your Bible with me to the book of Galatians. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? I'm not used to this Garth Brooks microphone. Um, so uh, Galatians is in the New Testament. It's after 2 Corinthians before Ephesians. And while you're turning there, just a little background. Uh, the area of Galatia today is the north central region of Turkey. And Paul went through here on his first missionary journey planting churches. Well, then after he left, there were these Judaizers that came through, and they were teaching that in order to be saved, you had to also adhere to the law of Moses um, and the oral law as well. So um, the biggest thing that they were dealing with is the Judaizers were saying, well, you Gentiles, if you're going to be saved, you must first be circumcised. The short of it is, if you want to be a good Christian, and fir first of all, you must be a good Jew, is what the Judaizers were teaching. So in this letter that Paul is writing back to the Galatians, he's going to uh, address this misconception. And so what I want to talk to you about today is what he would be saying here is the gospel truth. So if you found your way to Galatians chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, it reads, I marvel that you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another, only there are some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to the gospel we have proclaimed to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so I say again now, if any man is proclaiming to you a gospel contrary to what you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still trying to please men... I would not be a slave of Christ. Let's pause right here for a moment for a word of prayer. God, we thank you for the reading of your word. God, I pray that you will speak through me today and uh, divide your word correctly. And that, Father, that uh, the application you have for this message today, that we will take it and apply it to our hearts and to our lives. That we would not just be hearers only, but doers of the word. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So if, um, if we're going to know the gospel truth, the first thing we need to know is how to recognize the true gospel. Well, Paul is, he's astonished that these Galatians who he was, had not been away from for too long had so quickly abandoned the true gospel. Now, he says... He's talking here about um, going to other Gospels, but he says the truth is there is only one Gospel. Any other Gospel is altered, it's corrupt, it's distorted. There is only one Gospel. Now these Judaizers, they did not, com they did not present a completely brand new Gospel. They were saying that the Gospel... Is, is this, but you also have to do this. They were adding works-based salvation on top of that. So it was kind of more difficult to tell because there was still that truth in there. And you know, I found in life, most falsehoods do have a hint of truth to them. That makes them more deceptive. So what is the true gospel? Well, this is what Paul had preached to them on his first journey. Um, we often refer to the gospel in a nutshell, John 3.16, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And you know the gospel has not changed. The gospel is the same then as it is now. It's been the same through all generations. And if time 
continues to go on, it will never change. It will be the same gospel. This is so serious and so strange that he says, even if an angel from heaven were to come preach a different gospel, then it would be incorrect. It's not that the angels don't know the gospel, but if an angel were to come preach a different gospel, even coming from them, it would be wrong. God's word does not change, and he is serious about preserving it. And you may say, well, we have this gospel here in the, in the New Testament. What about all those that came before? What about their gospel? Did you know the gospel was originally preached to Adam and Eve? If you look in Genesis 3.15 where God is placing uh, the curse on the serpent, he said that there will be enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head and he and you shall bruise him on the heel. What this is speaking of is our Savior dying on the cross. When he died, this translation says bruise, some translations say crush. I like that one better. He crushed the head of Satan. And though Jesus died on the cross, he would rise again as if only to receive a mere bruise in the grand scheme of things. But they looked forward to the cross the same way that we look back. So there's no excuse even from Adam and Eve forward for there not to be the gospel truth. We have a sin debt we cannot pay. Jesus died to pay the fine. We must repent. We must make a 180 turn from our sin and place our faith in Jesus Christ the Savior and Lord. That's the gospel. That's the gospel in its most simplistic form, and that is the only one true gospel. Now, I mentioned about making a 180 from our sin and turning and repenting. I mentioned in our Sunday school class this morning, uh, we were talking about uh, some different things, and it came up to the the idea of about, well, um, sometimes, you know, Satan seems to be bothering us. Sometimes he's not. Friend, if you're not butting heads with Satan, you're moving in the same direction. If you are a child of God and you're in the Word, living as you should be, he can't take your salvation away, but he's going to do his best to make you ineffective. Rejoice. Rejoice. When those trials come. Because that means you're doing something right. But this is the one true gospel. There are many fakes though. And how do we recognize those? Well when bank employees are trained. To recognize counterfeit money. They are not trained to recognize. All the different ways. That a bill can be counterfeited. It's impossible. They're coming up with new ways to counterfeit every day. They are taught what the true currency looks like, feels like, I don't know, maybe even smells like. But they know the real deal. That way, if something does not measure up to all the specifications of that real dollar, $5, $10, $20, whichever, they know it's a fake. And that's what we have to do with the gospel. We have to know the true gospel so that we will not be deceived by gospel counterfeits. In verses 8 and 9, Paul declares that those who counterfeit the gospel will be accursed. This word accursed in the original language is anathema. And this is a very very serious term it means that they will be eternally condemned he says but even if we or an angel from heaven should proclaim to you a gospel contrary to the gospel we have proclaimed to you 
let them be eternally condemned. This is how serious God is about his word and about the gospel truth. Well, now that we know what the gospel looks like, we know the, the gospel is we had a debt, Christ died, we repent, we place our faith in Jesus. But where did this gospel come from? Was this a gospel that Paul had thought up? Was it something that he... No. If we read on in Galatians 1, 11 through 24, Paul says, For I make known to you, brothers, that the gospel which I am proclaiming as good news is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation of Jesus Christ. For you have heard of my former conduct in Judaism, how I used to persecute the church of God beyond measure and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries, among my countrymen, being far more zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who had set me apart from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might proclaim him as good news among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away to Arabia and returned once more to Damascus. Then three years later, I went up to Jerusalem to become acquainted with Cephas and stayed with him 15 days. But I did not see any other of the apostles except James, the Lord's brother. Now in what I am writing to you, I assure you before God that I am not lying. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and I was still unknown by sight to the churches of Judea, which are in Christ, but only they kept hearing. He who once persecuted us is now proclaiming the good news of the faith, which he once tried to destroy, and they were glorifying God because of me. You see, this true gospel is not from man. It's from God. It came down from God when it was preached in the Garden of Eden. It was God telling Adam and Eve. When Jesus came in the flesh to spread the gospel, he is God. It is his gospel. Paul did not receive it from man. He received it from God. And it was not anything that anyone had dreamed up. It was God's gospel. Now, Paul, when he was still known as Saul, excelled in his life in Judaism. He was on track to be high priest one day, I believe. If anyone knew the law, it was Paul. But the gospel of Christ, when Christ got a hold of Paul and showed him on that road to Damascus what he had been persecuting and how he was wrong, and he told, Christ told him the truth. He was set free from the law forever. Verse 24 says that God received the glory for Paul's preaching of the gospel. You see, if it were man's gospel, man would receive glory. But because it was God's gospel, God received the glory. So now we know um, how to recognize the gospel the origin of the gospel, so now let's talk about the freedom of the true gospel. If you'll skip on down with me to uh, Galatians chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 15, it reads, We are Jews by nature and not sinners from among the Gentiles. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified. But if, while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves have also been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, 
that Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness came, comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Christians, Christ sets us free from the law. We are no longer under the law. Now, we're still not supposed to steal, kill, lie, and so on. Those Ten Commandments, that's still what God holds as what's right and what's wrong. But we are not bound for our salvation to find justification in the law. And it says that Christ did not come to justify us through his blood so that we could just keep on in sin. So we are supposed to live a changed life. We're supposed to live in opposition to sin. Are we going to mess up? Yeah, I've messed up this morning, I'm sure. Amen? Amen. We're going to mess up. But the law is not what justifies us. It's the blood of Christ. It should never be a license to sin, nor should it be a get-out-of-hell-free card. There is more to salvation than that. So I want to ask you, Christian, what is it that you were saved from? When Jesus saved you, what did he save you from? Are you saved from hell, or are you saved from sin? You're saved from your sin. You're saved from hell because hell is the penalty of that sin. But if we go through life thinking, well, we're just, we're saved, we're not going to hell, we can just go on about our lives, we have completely missed it. And I believe making the distinction that we are saved from our sin makes a big difference. If we live as if saved from sin, then we will live to do our best to sin no more. But if we just live as if we've got a get-out-of-hell-free card, then we are more likely to continue in our sins. Verse 18 here says, For if I rebuild what I have once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. Now that's kind of a hard verse there, um, what that means, but basically this is saying if anyone says salvation is through Jesus and, Jesus and, Jesus and this, Jesus and that, but if they are saying you must be saved by Jesus and, they are preaching a false gospel. In the same way, it, it, it's the same way as saying, well, I believe that Jesus is powerful enough to save me, but now that he saved me, I've got to keep myself saved. And see, this is what the Judaizers were saying. You've got to do these things because you've got to be a good Jew in, a, in addition to being a good Christian, so you're saved, but you've got to do these things to remain saved. And that's wrong. If you're saved but you're doing works to keep yourself saved, you have not experienced true freedom in Christ. You're still trying to live under the law. You're still being burdened by that condition that you think, oh, I've got to do this. John chapter 10 tells us that my sheep hear my voice. This is Jesus speaking. And I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, ever. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Now this is what we deem as eternal security. Once we are in God's hand. No one can strip us away. So what that means is, once we are saved, 
There's nothing else we have to do. We live life that is pleasing to Christ, but our salvation is in him. I want to give you two math formulas. Do we have any mathematicians in here this morning, some that would rather not be mathematicians? First formula, Jesus plus anything equals nothing. Jesus plus anything equals nothing. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. He's all we need. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of work, so that no one may boast. So if this is not true, then, it's, then what verse 21 of Galatians 2 says, Christ died needlessly. If there's more we have to do, then Christ died needlessly. You know, I, I was thinking about this, that um, it says we've been saved through faith. It's the gift of God. We must receive that gift. Well, some people may say, well, receiving a gift, that's, that's a work. No. If you've ever received a gift, you receive it. You don't do anything for it. You receive it. Um, and you know, I've never heard anyone after receiving a gift say, man, you know what? I got the best thing. And when they gave it to me, you should have seen me tear into that paper. I was the best gift opener that you have ever seen. No, they say, I got this great thing. And let me tell you who gave it to me. The gift giver is the one that does the work, not the gift receiver. Uh, verse 19 tells us that law brings death, but faith in Christ brings life. And verse 20, that, that famous verse that I have been crucified with Christ, that means Christ took our cross, he took our penalty, he took our death, and we were spared literal death so that we can be made alive in him. See, we don't have to die on the cross. Persecution may come to this country one day to where the government starts hanging Christians on crosses. I don't know, but that will not add to nor take away from our salvation. That will literally be persecution. Jesus is the only one that could bring salvation. So now this morning in closing, I want to ask you a few questions. Is there something today that you are doing, something you've been doing, that you are doing in an attempt to earn your salvation? I've heard stories about the, uh, the billionaires, Carnegie and, and all those tycoons back in the uh, early part of last century, how they would try to outgive one another, giving to charity, giving to this, giving to that, in hopes that that would be their way to heaven. Is that something you're trying to do? Are you giving to the poor, to charity? Are you doing volunteer work? Are you, are you making sure that you're living better, comparing yourself to other people better than those that are around you? Those things aren't going to give you, get you to heaven. They're good things other than comparing yourself to someone else. Giving to charity is fine. Giving to the poor is fine. But it will not save you. You know, I've heard, I think I heard this on the, on the news one time. Some uh, great person in the community had passed away. And they were interviewing a guy on there and he said, you know, this guy, he would... He would give you the shirt off his back. If he didn't make it to heaven, there's no sense of any of us even trying. Well, I will agree there's no sense of us trying because there's nothing we can do outside of Jesus. But it's such an incorrect view of salvation. 
people trying to earn their way there. And my Christian brothers and sisters, are you doing works trying to maintain or to continue or to keep your salvation? Maybe one of these things I just mentioned, maybe you think, well, if, if I do these things, God will be pleased and I'm going to make it to heaven. Well, yeah, God will be pleased. But your eternal security is in Christ alone. The Roman Catholic Church has a list of sacraments that must be kept in order to be saved. We as Baptists, we observe the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Both are very important, uh, but neither add to or take away from our salvation. And let me make that clear. Being baptized is an outward display of an inner change. Baptism does not save you. And honestly, there have been a lot of people that have gone in dry centers and come out wet centers that were not saved to start with. <clears throat> Baptism is, is just to show everybody that you identify with Christ, that you have been saved. When we think about how we've been freed from the law, does it make sense for a prisoner to be freed from prison? Say, so you're, you're free to go, but then he turn around and walk back into the jail cell and sit down? If an animal is released from a, from a cage and that animal runs out and it turns around and runs right back in the trap, does that make sense? No. When we're giving freedom... We want to be free. And so many times we hold ourselves to a degree of legalism that we are trapped in, and I'll be honest with you, it will make you miserable. Some of the most miserable Christians are those that are trying to do things to keep their salvation. Maybe today there's someone here that says, you know, I need to be saved. I want to be saved, but there's just some things in my life I've got to fix and clean up first. Honestly, that day will never come. Don't try to do yourself what only Jesus can do. If you want to put, put it in fishing terms, I love those. I am here today Casting the net of the gospel. If anyone were to be caught and to be saved today, it's going to be up to God to clean you. We don't clean the fish. God cleans the fish. We're just taught to go out, cast the nets, and bring them in. Today, Aaron, if you want to come on, this altar is open. If anybody needs to come down and do business with the Lord, you can come pray. You don't have to say a thing to me, but I'm here if you want to, to talk to me further. If there's anyone that's interested in membership with the church, this is your time as well. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer, then uh, Aaron, if you'll lead us in a song after that. Our Father God, we thank you for for the freedom you have given us in Christ. God, that we don't have to live trying to please you. I think about all other religions in the world, and all of them are, are busy doing whatever, trying to earn their way to heaven, trying to please God, trying to deter God's wrath. But we as Christians are the only religion in the world that God is, is pleased to save us, to come to us. And God, I'm thankful that you love us so much. You love us how we are, but I'm thankful that you loved us enough to not leave us that way. God, if there's anyone here today that needs to be saved, needs to come down and pray about anything. I pray, Father, now that any 
um, roadblock or anything stopping them from coming would be removed today, Father. We give this time to you and place it in your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.